So let's start with slightly delayed. It's a pleasure to have Kieran here, and he'll talk. To us, he'll tell us all the data function and thanks. Okay, so uh, this is not quite the title uh, I gave. I am going to do a survey, uh, but the target, is, the goal is to <coughs> talk about a specific algorithm. So, um, uh, so uh, and what I'm doing is kind of an ongoing project. It's been ongoing for a while. Uh, hopefully, it's, this will actually go somewhere some more um, with data. Okay, so let me start out by this will help me, this will set some notation I need later. So in general, if x is an algebraic variety of dimension n over a finite field, uh, its data function is, well, you can define it as an Euler product, but for the purposes of this talk, you can just think of it as this formal power series with uh, uh, the count, the point counts of x over all the extensions of fq uh, put together in this funny generating function, and when you exponentiate, this turns out to have integer coefficients. Exercise. Um, uh, so this is not an exercise. Uh, so it was first shown by Dwork and then re-shown by Grothendieck that this is a rational function of t. This power series represents a rational function of t. Um, so in much of this talk, I, I want to assume x is not just an arbitrary variety, but a smooth proper variety. Then I can say a little bit more. Then uh, I can factor this thing in a precise way uh, as this alternating product, which this funny exponent means this. Uh, so <coughs> I have this alternating product of these factors pi. Uh, each pi is a polynomial with constant term 1. And the roots of pi in the complex plane have absolute value q to the minus i over 2. So this statement is the Riemann hypothesis aspect of the Bacon conjectures, which was proved by Deleen originally, uh, using a talk homology. Um, and there's also this symmetry that if you take polynomial 2n minus i and you read it backwards, you basically get polynomial i up to factors. Uh, and if x lifts to characteristic 0 as a smooth proper variety, then the degree of this pi is the ith Betty number of building. So, so these are basic properties about zeta functions. And so the thing you're supposed to take away is that the zeta function of a variety of rough q is some kind of fundamental invariant that one understands a lot about. And so one would like to be able to compute these things. So given x in some explicit form, well, you might also ask this question for x not given in an explicit form, like some moduli space or some Shimura variety or something. But for the purposes of this talk, uh, <coughs> I will be talking about x when it's given in an explicit form. So say it's written down with some sort of defining equation. Uh, so given x in an explicit form, one would like to compute the zeta function. Uh, in principle, once you bound the degree of the rational function, the numerator and the denominator, uh, it's a finite computation because you just need some coefficients, and you can get those coefficients by actually enumerating points over extensions of fq. But uh, in most cases, that computation will not be feasible because q to the n grows fairly quickly, uh, especially when n has to go out to a reasonable size. So uh, you know, typically, to actually list points on a variety of over fq to the n takes time q to the n times the dimension. Uh, so that's a big number. Uh, so uh, a more sensible thing to do um, is to use uh, an interpretation of these individual factors pi coming from the proof of the Bay conjecture. You interpret them as the characteristic polynomial, possibly in reverse, of some linear transformation on some vector space over a field of characteristic 0. Uh, so, for example, a tau cohomology provides an example, provides such a construction, but that construction is of a largely theoretical nature. It is actually not so easy to do a, 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 an explicit computation in an tau cohomology group, because somehow the, the growth and topology involved in, involves arbitrary tau covers with open, open subsets. Uh, it's not a very easy thing to make finitistic. Uh, by contrast, there, there, are, there is another approach to 
getting the properties of the data function, which in fact can prove all the whole Bay conjectures, uh, although that's not crucial for what we're doing. But uh, there, there is another approach to the properties of data functions in terms of p-adic analogs of Intel cohomology. And these have the advantage that they are much more directly translatable into algorithmic computations. So for example, well, I'll come back to this example in a moment. Uh, but the dwarf proof of rationality of the data function can effectively be turned into an algorithm. Um, so when we when we talk about using p-adic analytic methods to compute a data function, um, we should sort of think a little bit about what that means. So we're proposing to compute something p-adically. So as we heard yesterday, uh, p-adic numbers cannot be represented exactly on, on computers. Uh, and so uh, you, when, you, when you propose to do a p-adic computation, you always are working to some uh, p-adic accuracy, um, which might devolve over the course of the computation. But uh, if, you, if you give yourself enough accuracy at the beginning, you can hopefully uh, control how much accuracy you have at the end. And that's okay for this problem because uh, the polynomials we're trying to compute are known to have integer coefficients, and we can say something about how large those coefficients are. Um, and so once you do that, then uh, you can actually specify, if, and if, so if you know the degree of the polynomial you're trying to compute, and you know something about how big its roots are, then you can find some integer n uh, such that once you compute pi, to an p-adic accuracy of p to the n, once you compute each coefficient uh, modulo p to the n, then that will actually uniquely determine p n. So, uh, so the fact that we are looking for exact things of some kind of known size uh, allows us to use p-adic approximations to do the computation. So now we can really start thinking about doing the computation of this pi via p-adic analytic method. Um, and one other more point to make is, to, uh, in the case, most of the cases I'll talk about in this talk, x will not just be a smooth proper variety, but actually a smooth projective variety. And then the Lefschetz hyperplane theorem, say in a tall cohomology or a piatic cohomology, it doesn't matter, uh, tells you that uh, the the factors, right, remember the, the factors of uh, pi when i is greater than n are determined by the lower ones, by the functional equation. So really, you only need p0 up to pn. But when i is less than n, pi of x is the same thing as pi of a hyperplane section. So in practice, what this means is typically all the hard work is determining the middle cohomology, middle, the middle factor, pn, pn x t, I should say. Uh, so in practice, we only need to compute the pn, <coughs> the middle degree term. Okay. Um, so before I continue to talk about <coughs> algorithms, I, there are, there's one more, one or two more general comments that are worth making. Uh, these are not as well known as I think they should be. Um, if you read my, my notes on cyclic cubic threefold, they're, they're mentioned there, but these really should be sort of widely known remarks. Um, so <coughs> one remark, one of the remarks is that uh, the obvious way to decide how much precision you need is not quite optimal. So if you have a poly, if P, Pn has degree D, then uh, it's certainly determined by its coefficients up to d over 2 uh, by the functional equation. Uh, well, you have, you, have to, you have to know the sign of the functional equation. So maybe you want one more coefficient to straighten that out. Um, but, uh, so maybe you, yeah, maybe you want to add one to this. But. Might be zero, right? It's going to be zero. Right? Sorry? It might be zero. The extra coefficient that you add up to the sign might be zero. Minus that one. Uh, that, that's oh. Right. That doesn't happen. Yeah, typically, I mean, ideally you can determine the sign some other way, uh, but 
Yeah. So so generically, you. Yeah. Uh, uh, so so for example, when n is odd, you then the sign is always plus. So that's not an issue. So the issue is when n is even, like for k three surface or something. Uh, you might have to do a little bit more. But let's so let's ignore that possibility and just say that say that this is enough. I mean, in practice, what you can do is you can try both signs, and typically only one of them will give you a big <laughs> so, uh, so, very often you only need this much. Um, okay, so let's say you need this much. So then, the the the, the worst, th the hardest thing to do is to bound the middle coefficient. The middle coefficient has size bounded by, well, it's a sum of products <coughs> of uh, this many numbers. Th there are this many to choose from, so you have this many terms. Uh, each of those terms has this size, because it's a product of floor d, choose two, d over two many things, each of which is q to the size, q to the n over two. Uh, so if p to the n is bigger than, strictly larger than twice this number, then uh, a congruence modulo this determines the number exactly. Great. So that that's not optimal. Uh, I mean, this part is is best is the best you can do. But this part, this binomial coefficient is too large, because really you should not be bounding uh, the elementary symmetric functions because those have this many terms in the sum. But you should be bounding power sums because a power sum has d terms in it, no matter how many and no matter what degree you're talking about. So the ith power sum of the roots of the reciprocal roots, I should say, has norm at most this, which is the reciprocal roots. Right, the ones that have norm bigger than one. Uh, so really, all you need, to, and, and when you, when you, when you pass from, uh, when you run the, the Newton identities to solve for the elementary symmetric functions in terms of the, terms of the power sum, well, you do a division by d. But, so that's why you get a factor of d here. But uh, otherwise, it would be enough to know that p to the n is bigger than 2d over i times q to the n. Yeah, you divide by i, but you multiply by d. So this is a lot smaller than 2 times the binomial coefficients. Uh, so when p is not super large compared to the other parameters, uh, this is a, a noticeable improvement. Kiran, yeah. can I ask a question? Yeah. So when I was computing uh, zeta functions of mm -hmm. surfaces, was before you made these observations, and I was using your algorithm for recovering the Bayer polynomials from mm -hmm. low precision periodic yeah. approximations to them, where you, you list all Bayer polynomials that yeah. are congruent to. Does this observation make that algorithm redundant, or can you? Uh, no, I mean, I was using this in, in the course of that algorithm. So this observation was actually. But that, that was later. I mean, you sort of. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that, the, the algorithm to sort of reconstruct all the vague polynomials, yeah. actually, I use this observation to, to dramatically speed up the runtime of that algorithm. Yeah, in the second. All right, I think so, I was, you, you revised the algorithm, I think, didn't you? Uh, I'm not sure which version you were using. Yeah. But yeah, what, the one that was published uses the power sum construction to dramatically. So you can also use your algorithm, and you can still use that algorithm, I guess my question is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you want, you can use that. So right, so I, I have some, yeah. some algorithm, which is some kind of uh, tree search to, to identify Bayes polynomials from given some congruence information. And one of the things that helps you run that algorithm is this observation that power sums are, when you have a polynomial whose roots are, are of a given size, uh, you get much better control over the power sums than you do directly over the, the elementary special function. Yeah, so that, that uh, this observation is, is used in the, in, the, in the construction of that algorithm. Okay, uh, <coughs> but yeah, you can also use it to just give an a priori bound that says there's only one, there will be only one, which you then can find by this kind of search. But it's you know sometimes it's nice to know a priori that there's only that you're only you're only going to have one possible answer. Uh, okay, so that's one for his precision refinement. Use use control power sums instead of elementary symmetric functions. The other precision refinement that's worth keeping track of, because it will make a big difference in the example I'm going to show, is to use the Hodge filtration. So uh, if you know that x has a smooth projective lift to characters of 0 with certain Hodge <coughs> numbers, then 
the values of these Hodge numbers imply some divisibility property for the coefficients of the, the polynomial Pn. The, spe specifically, the Newton polygon lies on or above the Hodge polygon. So here's a concrete example. If K is a, is a K3 surface in P3, so then this polynomial has degree 21, and the coefficient of Ti will be forced to be divisible by P to the i minus 1. So as soon as you get past i equals 1, you start having some factors of P that are forced in there. Um, now, a priori, that you might not expect that that's going to help. That just means that you're, you're looking for some cancellation later. But if you're actually reading off Pn as a characteristic polynomial of a matrix uh, that's coming from Pn cohomology, then you can do better because the Hodge numbers imply not just a divisibility uh, among coefficients of the characteristic polynomial, they actually give you some lower bound on the elementary divisors of the matrix, which is a stronger statement. So for instance, for the K3 surface, um, the, second, the, the, the second elementary divisor uh, has to be divisible by P. So if you, if you, write, if you reduce the matrix mod P, um, it has rank 1, not 21. So that's really good because that, that means that, that uh, when, you, when you write down a p-adic approximation uh, of the matrix and take its characteristic polynomial, the accuracy of that approximation is much better than it would have been otherwise. So for instance, if you take this K3 example, uh, as soon as you write down that matrix modulo p squared, that's actually a good enough approximation to nail down all the coefficients. It's for, for large enough p. For, yeah, p bigger than 17 or something. You need P to be large compared to uh, the, the fixed constants like D and so on. I think actually, I think P greater than equals 17 is good enough. So yeah, once P is not tiny, uh, but yeah, and if P is, I mean, if P is a little bit smaller, then you get like a 3 or maybe a 4. Okay, so so it's worth it's worth c taking this kind of thing into account. Um, uh, especially when you start talking. So this is, this is not of any consequence for curves, <coughs> typically, because the Hodge numbers don't, don't, don't help you at all. But for higher dimensional varieties, using the Hodge filtration actually is very helpful. So, and, uh, so part, of the, part of the goal here is to talk about examples that might be relevant not just to number theorists, but also to, to, to people who are more physics minded. So those higher dimensional examples will definitely have, often have very interesting uh, hot problems. Okay, so here's the part, here's the survey part. Uh, I should keep track of how much, how long I've been going. Uh, you need a watch? Uh, I could use my phone for this, I suppose. Um, yeah, I'm not sure when we started exactly. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. All right. So I'll, I'll try to. So I'll try to be done by quarter past or so. Okay. Uh, okay. So here's the part where I give some kind of survey. Uh, so those of you coming to the GeoCrypt conference in Tahiti in a couple of weeks will hear a longer version of this survey. Uh, <coughs> this is sort of the rough draft of it. Um, so. <laughs> what are the different PIC techniques you could use, and when do they work well, and when do they work less well in practice? So this survey is going to, I'm going to be focusing quite a lot on what you can actually do uh, in examples of non-trivial size. So I'll start with the, the end, I'll start from the end of what's the most general thing you can do. So if I think an arbitrary variety, how would I compute, given explicitly, how would I compute a data function? Well, uh, an arbitrary variety can be covered by pieces that are affine hypersurfaces. Um, or you can, up to distro and union kind of thing. So, so you can reduce to uh, dealing with affine hypersurfaces, or maybe even hypersurfaces in, in the torus, but the affine hypersurfaces. So Dwarf's proof of the rationality for such things uh, is some kind of trace formula construction involving a certain compact operator on a p-adic Bonnock space. Uh, 
So, uh, of course, it's not so easy to do computations on infinite dimensional vector spaces, but if you're careful about how you bound things, you can approximate. I mean, the whole point of compact operators is you can approximate them well by finite rank operators, uh, and those you can actually write down. So, by being careful about this, Allen and Dutching one, uh, we're able to extract an algorithm for computing this thing, which is which say for fixed dimension is polynomial time in P, uh, the degree of the hypersurface and the uh, exponent over the prime field. So this is of course not true polynomial time in the input uh, unless you fix P, because right polynomial time in the input would involve log P and the other thing. But when P is small, this is this is good. This is as good as polynomial time. Um, unfortunately, polynomial time can be quite large, right? Uh, <laughs> the exponents in here. I don't know if uh, anyone ever actually made a careful attempt to bound uh, what the what the what the runtime is. There's the, explicit bounds in the paper. Okay, so there are bounds in the paper. I don't know if they're optimal though. No, they're I mean, the bounds in the paper are 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 scary. Uh, I, I I don't know how. Well, you can optimize, but I, I, I don't think anyone has tried hard enough to, to actually get it down to a, a practical size. I'll maybe you know better than me. Uh, I mean, except I mean, in some special cases. Yeah, that, I was going to correct that there are no algorithms that work based on this approach so far. I mean, you said okay, so cases, but this, this, there aren't any. Oh, I mean, you mean even like for hard and trier curves, this general thing doesn't work? Doesn't well, work I don't think anyone's ever computed anything with it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so I, sorry, I, I stand corrected. So, you, so. Basically, no special behavior can be made to work. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I stand corrected. Um, so David Harvey is working on something that sort of resembles this, but is more like the the, the formula for Hasse Witt matrices. So you involve sort of p minus first powers of things. Uh, it remains to be seen whether that can compute any examples either. But, uh, but it, it, ha it, ha it has a similar flavor, although not. <coughs> I guess I guess we decided this is more like this is, th this thing is more like Dwork's paper before he proved rationality, where he proves <coughs> rationality modulo p to the n for each fixed n. So once you know rationality and you have some bound on the exponents, it's of course sufficient to compute modulo p to the large power p. Uh, okay, so that's kind of the general the end of generality. If you swing all the way to the other end. We heard mentioned yesterday about Sato's algorithm for computing uh, the zeta function of an ordinary elliptic curve using the, the, the canonical lift, the Doring lift, or <coughs> what generalizes to the serotate canonical lift for an ordinary Abelian variety. Um, so this is quite practical when p is small. Um, a can be quite large. Um, and when p equals 2, you can even hammer this exponent down using uh, Mestre's AGM iteration. Um, and I mean, the, the records of this are kind of ridiculous, right? I think that the record computation for this is, involves A being what, 10 to the fifth or something, or maybe bigger, you know, maybe uh, So you can do enormous computations with this, but we're talking about elliptic curves. So from the point of view of geometry, uh, uh, this is not so 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 general. Um, this this may, and. You know, even if you're a cryptographer, you might be a little bit disappointed because this doesn't work so well for genus two curves. Um, I mean, you could try to do Sato's algorithm, but you have to work with Jacobians because uh, it's not so straightforward to, I mean, you can't write down a, a genus two curve with a lift of the Frobenius. So you really have to think on the level of Jacobians and then it gets a little bit harder. You, uh, yeah, in principle, you could try to do it, but. I don't know if anyone has made a, a strong effort to, to work, work out. Uh, I guess AGM has been worked out in genus two. So, so that when p equals two, you can you can do this. And you could try to do AGM for a, for a higher p. David Cole has sort of written out how you do this. But this is this is not the direction that I want to sort of go because the, so the generality th this is fairly specific. So I'm going to sort of get a little less specificity. Uh, using a different technique. So, so once upon a time, uh, about 2001 or so, uh, I wrote down an algorithm uh, for the zeta functions of hyperelliptic curves, well, specifically odd characteristic with a Raffle-Weierstrass point. Uh, uh, 
And that algorithm was p-adic, but it was not quite of the same form as the previous one. Um, it really used p-adic cohomology. So it really used the interpretation of the characteristic of the interesting factor, p1, um, as the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius, uh, maybe I should say p1. So by realizing p1 as the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius on some explicit vector space, um, so some explicit linear transformation on some explicit vector space. And this is called Monsky Washington cohomology. Uh, well, it's really of the affine curve of two by the Weierstrass points. Um, I, I won't say more about this particular construction in this talk, but we will see a variant of it for the case of toric hypersurfaces that I actually am talking about. So we'll see the general flavor, we'll see the general form of this construction a little bit later. Um, so the runtime is has this kind of form, um, at least asymptotically. Um, the point is that it, it is feasible uh, both in the uh, in the sort of the p in, in sort of all the aspects. So you can make a, you, if, so you can do examples where a is large, where the other things are small. Or you can do examples where g is fairly sizable, or you can run p out to a decent size. So it sort of has decent behavior in all the parameters, even in practice. Um, and yeah, so this is this is implemented in both Magma and Sage. So you can, you can, you can do experiments with it. Um, and there are lots of generalizations that have been that have been cooked up since then. So just talking about curves, there's kind of a sequence of things. Um, uh, so I gave Jan credit for all curves. I don't know if that, that, that maybe I don't know if that's with some conditions. With conditions, but but in, I was Attention. It, it yeah it. it well, some of these later, I mean, once you get down to here, these have started to be potential. Uh, this, already, this one is already a little bit potential. Uh, right, so, but Sorry, what do you mean a little bit potential? Meaning that, that executing, so as you go sort of further down this list, well, uh, at least up to here, sort of from here to here, your ability to do this in practice gets sort of less and less as you go down the list. Uh, this one, uh, it's sort of, it's maybe not quite in the right place because for special cases, it's it's feasible. More feasible than the non-general Yeah, so I, maybe I should switch. Yeah, it's just that I was trying to sort by generality, and your thing is in principle uh, So, so yeah, roughly speaking, as you go down the list, it gets harder to do these things in practice. Um, uh, we're later this afternoon, uh, there will be a talk. Uh, about a different approach for curves that looks like it might actually be a, a more practical approach in in parallel general cases um, using duality for cup product. Uh, so if for, for the experts, this uh, this 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 uh, omits the proof of the comp computation of Coleman integration, which is implicit. In the uh, okay, so so that's kind of a survey about curves, but. I'm really you know, aiming towards higher dimensional varieties, so let me kind of say what is known. In, well, before I do that, let me talk about improvements. So David has a couple of improvements in the hyperelliptic case, uh, as particularly in the case where you, you want to vary p and make p larger. Um, so for example, uh, there, so uh, he has an, uh, an improvement uh, on the dependence of p for hyperelliptic curves to, to p to the one half plus l of one, this is implemented in Sage. Uh, it uses a modified description of the Frobenius action on p-adic cohomology, which will crop up again in our context as well. Um, it also uses a, a technique for accelerating recurrences, uh, <coughs> matrix sort of computation of sequences of matrices which are defined by recurrence relations. Uh, so that's one kind of improvement. Uh, more recently, uh, so this is a this preprint is is been out for a few months. Uh, David has a method for amortizing the computation of data functions. Uh, if you take an elliptic curve over Q or a hyperelliptic curve over Q, and you want the zeta function over FP for all p less than or equal to some bound, for instance, this tells you this gives you the L function coefficients up to some bound, which you might want for, say, computing the special value and comparing it to 
the prediction made by the Bertz winnikin dyer conjecture. Uh, so there's a method to do this, which when you amortize over all of these primes, you actually get what, uh, true polynomial time. So you get polynomial in log p um, and the other parameters per prime. So you have one global factor of this x, and then the rest is the rest is is, is well behaved. Uh, and this sort of incorporates uh, a method that I guess is due to this uh, Gerbich, I think. If I'm trying to it's Hungarian. It's Hungarian, so that would be Gerbich. Uh, so so this idea that Gerbich proposed uh, in the context of computing. Uh, Wilson quotient. So take p minus 1 factorial mod p squared. You know it's minus 1 mod p. If you ask what it is mod p squared. Um, this is some clever algorithmic thing uh, that it turns out when you sort of, when you, when you look at this construction, you see that you can in integrate it together with this idea. This is like can, can I just, yes. I don't know if you're going to mention this later on, but um, something I don't think has been written down, that, that um, square root of p algorithm. If you if you do the same algebra but you don't use the matrix recurrences, then you get an O of p time algorithm. But I don't think it's been pointed out that you get O of log p space, which is I think different to all these other algorithms you've talked about. Uh, yeah, it's it's certainly well, it's certainly in common with the one that I'm going to describe yeah, later. Right. But uh, yeah, that's true. So this has a yeah, that's true. This algorithm, if you if you if you don't change if you don't take it down to p to the one half. It's O of P, but yeah, it's very economical for, for space. Uh, so that's, that can be an important optimization in some cases. Yeah, and that feature will be shared by the thing that I'm going to talk about for, for hypersurface. Okay, so, uh, so now let's, let me go to higher dimensions. So uh, a few years ago, I had two summer students, uh, Tim Abbott and David Rowe, uh, David Rose, we've heard about yesterday, his postdoc at Calgary. Uh, Tim Abbott uh, works at a startup. Uh, so uh, with them, we, we, we implemented an algorithm that computes the zeta function of a smooth projective hypersurface. Um, and the main idea, which we'll, again, we'll see this a little later, because I, I'll use it in the algorithm I'm talking about, is that uh, the, if you take a hypersurface in Pn, its complement is affine. And the, the monsky weistetzer cohomology is defined for affine varieties, so it's convenient to use that particular affine variety, the complement of the hypersurface, <coughs> especially because it has a very easy Frobenius lift. Um, so, uh, so it's, it's very easy to write down, but the dependence on p uh, grows with the dimension in a, in a kind of inconvenient way. Um, and if you try to if you try to generalize the Castor and for cover and the non-degenerate curves uh, construction I mentioned earlier, it has a similar feature. So I, I started writing this up a few years ago, and then I stopped when I discovered that it was going to be p to the n. Um, uh, and the reason I stopped is because I knew there was an O of p method that Alan Water had described in terms of deformations. Um, I think if you use the fibration construction, where you kind of fiber and curve and you do a relative construction, I think that's also O of p. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, so there, are the, there are these ferments for higher dimensional varieties. You can either do that vibration construction, or deformations means you take a one-parameter family, you take a pencil, say, of hypersurfaces, and that has a, a, a that gives rise to a Ricard Fuchs equation or a gauss meinin connection, however you want to think about it, and uh, the the Frobenius action on the relative p-adic cohomology. Um, respects this connection, so, so, it, so it's all it satisfies some differential equation, which once you know, once you have an initial condition, you can solve the differential equation, and that gives you a very good algorithm. Um, well, it gives you a good algorithm uh, depending on how uh, how many singularities the connection has, and uh, so as the de as the degree of the hypersurface goes up, the connection requires a lot of singularities. Uh, so. I don't know in practice how how uh, how far this has been carried out, say for hypersurfaces. When the polynomial is sparse, you get fewer singularities, so that helps. Um, so I forget. Did, uh, I'm trying to remember whether Klostermann did this for monomial definitions. Uh, we, in the paper with Sebastian, we did like uh, uh, 
robotic increase in mm -hmm. the tree over F7, but a dense one, mm -hmm. and, and that took 20 minutes. Okay. So it, so it is doable, and it, so it's doable, say, in... But you're right that it goes up a lot. Yeah, so for higher degrees, it's going to get, it's going to get a little bit scary. Yes? Hello, Kastrick, can I have to call him? Do you know if that's P or P squared? Oh, well, I, I was claiming it's like P to the N or something, or do you mean... Yeah, because that suggests it's P to the 1, and I thought it was more like P squared, but I'm not sure. Oh, you mean for curves? Yeah, for curves. Ah, uh, well, it's... I think it's P. Yeah. It's P. I thought it was P for curves, okay. and it's P to the N for... Okay. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I might... The AKR might actually Dense be P to the N plus 1. Yeah, I might be misremembering. With dense polynomial power series and two variables. Oh, you mean the Frobenius lift is dense in two variables? Oh. Yeah, that's what I'm worried about. Uh, does it have some homogeneity property? I don't know if that's going to help. Yeah, okay, so in any case... Oh, yeah, so you can control the degree of one variable, but it is, but it is a sparse sort of within us. Uh, okay, so uh, another technique that we're going to hear about uh, on Friday, or well, I won't be here, but the rest of you will hear about it on Friday, uh, is sperber voigt So this is again uh, going back to dwarf cohomology, but it's using the fact that for not, well, non degenerate hypersurfaces, which we'll see in a moment, um, you, can, you, you can replace the infinite dimensional vector space with a finite dimensional vector space and make the computation. Uh, this is, this, uh, if you do it for dense polynomials, it ha again has a bad dependence on P, but for sparse polynomials, it's doable. So for monomial deformations, it's probably quite doable. Uh, I haven't tried it. I don't know if John has. But. So, so that's, a, that's a possibility for sparse polynomials. The thing I'm going to describe also works, has, is nice for sparse polynomials. Uh, but I, I, we were really thinking about dense. So the variance that I want to describe is a variant of this AKR, which has good dependence on P, has linear dependence on P, and reasonable dependence on other things. It can handle dense polynomials really well. And we'll actually show a, a rather large example. So it's, it's quite feasible in practice. Um, so one trade-off, which is a reasonable trade-off, I mean, it's common with, with the, just this generalization and this one, is that we, we don't treat completely general hypersurfaces, but uh, as a bonus, it makes it easier to pick up many more examples. And that's the, how, one of the points I want to emphasize, is that in this audience, it's possible. One doesn't necessarily want to have, take really, really large P. One maybe wants to take some moderately sized P, like 7, um, but do an interesting higher dimensional example, you know, say a threefold, some sort. Fabiat threefold. Okay, so let's Let's talk about non degenerate hypersurfaces. Okay, so uh, let me set language of torque varieties. So, torque varieties over a ring are defined in terms of lattice bands. And since I'm only going to talk about projective torque varieties, I'll just define them in terms of polytopes. But first, I need a lattice. So, L is going to be a lattice of rank n. You can imagine, you can imagine fixing a basis if, if you want. Um, then, when, if you fix a basis, then the monoid algebra for, well, the group algebra, really, um, is just a Laurent polynomial ring over R in variables corresponding to the lattice generators. So you can just think about, I'm taking, I'm taking a Laurent polynomial ring over some base ring. Um, and there are, there are natural generators on this thing, which in terms of the Laurent polynomial ring, these are sort of the logarithmic partial derivatives, xi partial with respect to xi. Um, in terms of lattices, well, okay, each uh, element of the dual lattice defines a functional on the lattice, and that gives me a derivation like so. Um, and so that's the coordinate-free way of saying the same thing. So I'm going to be interested in these logarithmic differentials. Derivation. And now, if I take a convex lattice polytope of full dimension, in, in my lattice. So I take a convex hollow of some finite subset, um, and full dimension means it's not contained in any hy proper hyperplane, <coughs> proper, hyper, proper linear, su uh, proper affine subspace. 
uh, by hyperplane. Uh, then if you take the cone over that polytope, that's a fan that defines a, 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 a toric variety, which is not only projective, but actually comes with a fixed ample line bundle from the construction. So in the example where we, we are, we're going to think about, you can, you can get this in a, in a sort of a stupid way. You just take the lattice points in dilates of the polytope, and you just take the graded ring on those, and you take prime of that. Uh, that doesn't work in more pathological cases. So this works uh, in dimension two. So, uh, so if you read about non-degenerate curves, uh, then this actually is, th this, this always works. But uh, in dimension three and higher, it doesn't. So really, you have to take P to be some more clever thing defined by Cox, uh, called the homogeneous coordinate ring, or actually, I think most other people call it the Cox ring. But, uh, anyway. But uh, so for example, if you want to think about projective space, then the stupid thing works. You just take the simplex, the standard simplex in Zn, and when you do the when you do the naive construction, you, you get the right answer. You get projective space with the usual ample line bundle of one. Um, and likewise, you can get a, project, a weighted projective space if you take a, a simplex uh, where the vertices are stretched out in some funny way. And you can take products by taking products of polytopes, and you can do toric blowups by kind of subdividing faces and so on. Uh, and if you replace the polytope by a dilate of it, well, you get the same x, but you replace the line bundle by its d power. So uh, in practice, I'm going to want to think about my, my function uh, as a section of the O of 1 defined by this, uh, by this polytope. So I'm going to say, for instance, if I want to do projective space and I want to take a degree 4, hy degree four hypersurface, I'm going to think about the polytope as being four times the standard. Uh, so what is it? What, so what is a, a, a non-degenerate hypersurface in this in this projective toric variety? Uh, well, non-degenerate means well there are, uh, there are a couple of equivalent characterizations. One is that the hypersurface cut out by F has transversal intersection with each torus in the natural stratification, including the big torus. Uh, so that implies that the, the hypersurface is smooth, uh, but not conversely. So in particular, if I require this for the zero-dimensional strata, then F is forced to have Newton polytope uh, delta. Sorry. Oh, I see. If, if I take a D here, then yeah. So I'm going to take D equals 1 eventually. But, um, on this slide, you can take D three. Um, what has to be a little bit careful and characteristic P if, P, if P is very small, and this might not quite be the exact definition I want, but I'm going to gloss over that. Um, so another way to characterize this is that if you take the toric Jacobian ideal, so you take the ideal generated by F and its logarithmic partial derivatives, uh, this ideal is irrelevant. So it, it, uh, the quotient by this ideal, which is the, the toric Jacobian ring, is finite of the normal module. Uh, so this condition is satisfied generically, at least when delta, when delta is nice enough. I'm not sure if it's, that's true in general. Um, and yeah, so non-degenerate implies smooth. So I'll mostly be interested in, in non-degenerate. I think it is true in general. Really? Uh, I, I think it's probably true in general, but I don't actually know a reference to that. Um, okay, that's... That's not true for an arbitrary polytope. Okay. For, very, for like the bad example you gave. Yeah. For the Cox ring, if you do that in characteristic three. Oh, in characteristic. Oh, in positive characteristic. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But in characteristic zero. Then it's always. Then it is generic. Okay. So in characteristic p, you have to be able to carefully <coughs> step it. Uh, so in practice, we're we're mostly going to be dealing with cases where p is not extremely small. So we'll kind of avoid the problem. Okay. So some examples of this of, of hypersurfaces that come from Dura varieties. So if I take, uh, in, any, in the case n equals 2, if I take the standard <laughs> simplex and dilate it by d, I get a smooth plane curve whose genus degree is d, and therefore its genus is uh, d 
minus one choose two, maybe? Yes. So D minus one choose two. Jet lag strikes. Okay. So, uh, and you can get hyperelliptic curves, you can get odd hyperelliptic curves by taking a weighted projected space. You can get even hyperelliptic <coughs> curves by taking a P1 cross P1, or yeah, P1 cross P1. Uh, in weighted projective space, you can also get CAB curves. Um, in higher dimensions, you can get things like, um, I suppose when you, when you take uh, this degree to be n plus 1 in projective space, you get something Calabi out. So here you get a, a K3 surface, a quartic surface is K3, and a quintic threefold is the Calabi out. So this, I mean, there, of course, there are lots of other examples you might want to take. Um, if you are more comfortable with Torah varieties, you can cook up examples that are like other so examples of things that have mirrors. In, in all these examples, non degenerate is, is stronger than... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, no, I'm not saying that okay. anything like this that occurs in this way is non degeneracy So, <coughs> yeah. No, so non-degeneracy is, is, is going to be generic, a generic condition after you restrict the each class. <coughs> But these are the kinds of things that you would get if you take it. Okay, so now let me talk about an algorithm in, say, in 15 minutes or so. Let me talk about an algorithm for computing the zeta function of a non degenerate hyperspace. Okay, so now I'm going to insist that I take degree <coughs> one according to the polytope. So if f is if you want something in degree d, well, res rescale the polytope, so now you're talking about degree 1. Um, so I take f and p1 non-degenerate, and now um, I take, uh, if I look at the complement of this hypersurface, this is an affine scheme whose coordinate ring looks like this. It's You take pm and you take f to the minus m. Right, just because I took proj at p, and now I'm taking the the distinguished open subset corresponding to f. So that's affine with this with this ring. Um, the weak completion of this thing. So this is a, this is a construction um, from the Mosky Westminster papers. So the weak completion of this ring uh, consists of infinite series uh, g m p to the minus m g m in p m. Uh, such that the p-adic valuation of gm grows linearly uh, with m. So, so it's the, 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 the true p-adic completion um, would only have the condition that this valuation goes to infinity with m, but potentially very slowly. So here I, I, I put a growth condition on the p-adic valuations, um, and this is useful because it gives you the right to Rom cohomology. If you take S dagger, and you invert P, and you take the sort of continuous Durand complex uh, relative to uh, the fraction field of ZQ. So ZQ is, of course, the unramified extension of ZP with residue field FQ. QQ is this fraction field. If you take this Durand complex, so you just take differentials in the, in the natural way, then the, the cohomology of the Durand complex is what's called mosky washington cohomology, and it receives a trace formula uh, in the following way. So if I define a Frobenius lift on S dagger by, so I'm going to, it's going to be semi-linear, so I, I, so there's a, there's a, if, if Q is not P, then ZQ has a, has an endomorphism lifting the P power map, the absolute Frobenius lift. Um, so if I take that action on coefficients, and then I have, I take monomials to act as by p powers, uh, and then I extend the map to the weak completion in the only conceivable way, where I take this thing and I take it to well sigma of gm, and then sigma of f raised to the minus m power, formally by the binomial series. That's what this is. So this of course, this expression is visible by p. So this gives me a valid element of the weak completion. Clear? Uh, this of course is an integer. Uh, then this gives, so this defines an endomorphism of S dagger, and if you, if you uh, take the corresponding <coughs> on uh, 
homology. So uh, the the only interesting part is, of course, the the uh, the Hn in this case. The other ones are just give you these factors. So the zeta function of Zf has these trivial factors plus this Pf placed in the right placed in the right place. Um, where Pf is essentially the, the reciprocal characteristic polynomial of sigma to the a, right? So, if, so a is log base p of q. So uh, sigma is, is semi-linear over r. This thing is linear over r when I take this power. So now it, it, it gives me a well-defined linear transformation on this thing. And the characteristic polynomial of that computes the zeta function. So, so this, is this is an example of Maltese trace formula. Um, well, I'm, I'm secretly using the fact that really I should have a, the inverse of this times q to the n, but there's some duality. Uh, oh, I might be off by a factor of p here, actually. I think that duality. But, uh, okay, so I think, I think I'm missing a q inverse here, but I, th I think I'll change, fix that. Um, no, actually, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing a q, so let me fix it now. Yeah, there's a, the the factor of the extra factor of q comes from the fact that there is a this is somehow I'm I'm comparing the cohomology the, the n minus first cohomology of zf with the nth cohomology of its complement and when you do that you you pick up a twist you pick up a take twist so you get a factor you, there's a, you get an extra factor of q that you multiply by that. okay. So uh, how do you compute the action of Frobenius on cohomology? Well, you, you can pick a basis of, of cohomology. So you can pick differential forms that, that, act, that lift a basis on cohomology, and then formally apply Frobenius to each one. That will give you some infinite series. So you truncate them somewhere. And now you have some finite expression with a large denominator of f. And you reduce this using the Griffiths dwarf method that was mentioned yesterday afternoon. Um, so you take this sort of natural generator. Um, it was called uh, capital omega, and I failed to change it once on the slide. So maybe I should call it capital omega, but I was using capital omega to mean the module of differentials. So I didn't want to conflict with that. So I'm calling it little omega. But anyway, so it's some standard differential. And so there, there's one obvious relation that if you have f upstairs and f downstairs, you can cancel it. And there's a less obvious relation. This is really the one that was, that was crucial in the, in, the, in, the, in the talk yesterday afternoon, that if you have a multiple of a, one of the partial derivatives of f, you can get rid of it at the expense of taking the partial derivative of g, corresponding partial derivative, and also dividing by m, or m plus 1 is the full order you started. Um, this, of course, does not work when m equals 0, so be careful. Um, and now using a result which is really due to Macaulay, uh, you, can, you can lower the pole order all the way down to n, where n is the number of variables, and then some, take care of the rest with some linear algebra, or even you actually you can, you can continue to run the algorithm except you have error terms. So, so, this is, this was, so yesterday, this was a method for computing a picard fuchs equation. Um, it also is the method that's used to do computations in AKM. So you can use it in PI cohomology. Um, is, is it still called a uh, theorem of Holly in the TART case? Um, it should be. I mean, it, it's. Yeah, I, I don't know if Macaulay literally stated that way, but he, I mean, he was doing. I mean, he's. But it comes down to the fact that it's that regular that sequence these stuff. These rings are Cohen Macaulay. <laughs> 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 Uh, and that you know the, the, that property is called up because it has been around. So so okay, and maybe I'm lying slightly there to call these theorems. But it uses the fact that that rings of that ri that quarter rings of affine torus varieties are called Macaulay relative to the base ring. Okay, so one uh, so now the problem with with doing this uh, in practice. So the AKR algorithm did succeed in computing zeta functions of, of K3 surfaces over. F29, I think, is the largest one I did. But that took a week uh, <coughs> in magma. Um, and, and the reason, and OK, you could maybe optimize it by, by, 
by putting it in more compiled code. But part of the problem was that you're using dense polynomials. You, you're forced to use polynomials that are dense of degree p times n. So that's when p gets large, this is a problem. <coughs> so there's a way around this, though, which um, I'll, come, I'll mention in a moment. But first, I should say that um, the truncation modulo p to the n does not guarantee that the n is a correct modulo p to the n, because there are some divisions involved in the reduction process. However, the, 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 the final denominator, when you take some large differential and reduce it, uh, the denominator is much smaller than you would expect by simply counting the number of divisions that you do along the way. The number of divisions you do along the way is linear in the degree, and the degree of the pole, but the loss of precision is actually logarithmic in the degree of the pole. So, uh, so really, in, in practice, the working precision only needs to be larger than the final precision by some log factor. So, uh, and this is particularly true when p is, is not is larger than n. But even when p is small, you can, if you're careful enough, which I don't think we were in the AKR paper, you can you can pin this down. Okay, uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna, I, I, for the purposes of the rest of the talk, I'm mostly gonna ignore the difference between the working position and the final position, because they, they're they not so different. In practice, you have to keep track. Okay, so here is, so this slide is, is a calculation, which is essentially the one that David made in the paper on hyperelliptic curves uh, in, order to, in order to set up the p to the 1 half algorithm. So the point is that you can represent Frobenius in a more sparse fashion than you would than you would have thought. So if you take gm divided by f to the m, well, formally, the expression Frobenius is an infinite sum that looks like so. But let's say I truncate it, because of course, when I actually compute, I will I need to truncate. So I might as well truncate it. And now the trick is not to leave it in the infinite sum representation, but change the representation to uh, to really only involve sigmas of things. So try to find a sparse representation. And the way you do that is you simply expand this thing, again, as a binomial coefficient. It's a binomial <coughs> sum. And then just reassemble terms. So you cancel positive powers of f against negative powers of f. You just sum things together, um, and you get this expression. So effectively, you're undoing the binomial expansion that got you to this point. Um, and what you have, and so you end up with an expression which is no longer the truncation of a p-adically convergent series, um, I mean, unless you do partial summation to, to put it back in the form, but uh, it is sparse. It involves all the, all the terms on the right-hand side. Are, these are some integers. This is my pole. And this is, this is a sigma of something. So this involves only monomials which are p-powers. So in that respect, it's sparse. And so as when p is large, this is especially sparse. Um, and if g, were, if, if f is sparse, uh, then this is also relatively sparse. So this, so not only does this help you take advantage of sparsity when p is large, it helps you take advantage of sparsity when f is sparse. Although I'm not going to mm. take advantage of that to a some extent. It's you still have to, you still have to range over all the g's. But yeah, I also just worry that the powers of f will rapidly become unsparse in the sense that you want. Yeah, it depends how much. It depends, it depends how big how n is. Yeah, yeah. Big n is. Yeah, it depends how big n is. That's true. So I mean, it, I don't think this is as uh, optimized for the sparse case of Sperber boy but it does help a little bit. Okay, so now here's the here's somehow the key. Well, the first slide was somehow the first key point, and the second key point is that that sparseness in the representation can be preserved by reduction. Um, but, it, but not if you just do the Griffith's dwarf reduction directly. You have to be more careful. And the way you be more careful is you say to yourself, well, uh, when, the, when I have terms of degree large enough, say n plus 1, then anything of degree n plus 1 uh, is a linear common, is in the ideal generated by f and its partial derivatives. So I can split it. And if I split each monomial, then I can just formally make a linear map that does this. Uh, and and then oh I didn't tell you what R and S are um, I'm not sure I should but so 
for there are some explicit expressions R and S, which um, I can show you in the in, a, in the other tech file that I'm writing. Uh, so they're here, just for so they're they're fairly explicit expressions. So they they involve these projections, and then you take the partial derivative of this one, and then you have some you have some some integers determined by the monomials. Okay, so for certain expressions like so, the key point is that they're ex they're easy to write down. So for certain explicit <coughs> expressions in terms in terms of these things, uh, you can write down the reduction uh, of mu j plus one to mu j with the with the carryover term, um, and um, I guess part of the point is that if you do, if you want to eliminate a lump, mu to the p, if you want to eliminate a single monomial many times, then the only variation here is that you have two fixed matrices and you're just varying the linear combination between them. So uh, if you build yourself a little uh, Cython routine to do this kind of product, um, you can feed these integers in. And, and get them back out. And so if you were trying to implement this in Sage, that's probably this part would probably want to be optimized. This sort of forming this kind of product uh, as J ranges from zero to P minus one. So then this is the this will be the bottleneck step here. Doing this. Um, and then afterwards you divide by these integers. But so yeah, uh, so you can strip out mu to the P by multiplying together P matrices of size. Um, well, the size is volume of delta times n to the n, or so. Um, that's uh, not quite optimal. I, I will I, maybe I'll skip over the the optimization, but you can save a factor of about e to the n by using a slightly more complicated uh, reduction process. So you will you won't have linear polynomials in J. You'll have polynomials degree n. But in practice, you do want to use smaller matrices than what I'm implying here. But in print, you can think about this as a, as a conceptual framework. So now, what do you do? Um, so if you if you go back to, so you, you you have so you need to reduce things in cohomology that look like this times omega. So this thing you split up into monomials. So now you have a bunch of monomials of various degrees with sigma applied to them. And for each of those, you can use co this controlled reduction to, to completely simplify the expression. Well, at least if, if, if P is generated in degree one, which is the examples we've tried. Well, the examples we've tried are mostly projective um, But But in, in, in case P is generated in degree one, essentially this thing you write as a product of monomials. So this thing, you, F to the J, you can already write as a product of degree one monomials because F is degree one. Um, so the only issue is about this piece. So let's say I can write this thing as product of degree one monomials. Then I can run this process with one monomial at a time to strip out one monomial at the expense of I have some co cofactor of degree n that I carry along. Um, but then when I get down to the bottom, I just do explicit linear algebra um, of you know, on the thing of degree n. Uh, which is the same thing that I would have done, say, to compute a crop truth equation. Uh, okay, so, in, and I should say that the, the, the matrices you're going to get at the end are slightly larger than the ones that you actually uh, want for the zeta function. So, for instance, for a quartic A3 surface, you end up with a something of size 64 when the, the zeta function has a term of degree 21. But uh, I think it's possible to explicitly sort of cut out the, the, the matrix of the right size when I had to look this out. Uh, in any case, so in, in, in the example of projective space, this is this is dumb. It's in the implementation. So you think you can do 21 all the way down? No. Okay. No, no, I'm not saying I can do 21 all the way down. Okay. I'm just saying that once I get down to the 64, okay. there should be some explicit formula for finding the 20, what size, size 21 matrix in the size 64. But no, I, you, I think, I, I don't know how to do better than carrying 
64, which is the volume of the poly, and, and factorial times the volume of the polytope to carry that all the way through. Okay, so a bit of complexity analysis. Uh, the main point is that the direct dependence on P is going to be linear. The bottlenecks, well, unless A is, if log P of Q is large, then there's a norm step at the end that, that I'm ignoring. But say if Q is P, then the, the, the bottleneck is the controlled reduction. Writing down the Frobenius is essentially trivial. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just a very short, a very explicit formula for it, and it's sparse. So, so all, all the hard work is, is the controlled reduction, and the, the round of the number of rounds is basically the number of monomials of degree little n plus big n. Um, and the, so, for each of those, you have to do one of these p-fold products, and the matrices are size and n factorial times the volume of delta. So you get some kind of dependence, which I haven't really costed out very carefully. Um, although if I look at the degree, so I, the degree of n, so if you, if you take, say, projective space and you take a, uh, a hypersurface degree d, so you're getting a d to the n in the volume of delta. So here I'm getting d to the maybe 4n or so. But there's also a factor coming from the p-adic precision that you need to carry around. So that's another uh, factor of... Uh, I don't know how big that is. It's also N like times, yeah, something like that. Yeah, or like n times dZn or something. Like that. Uh, yeah, so so I think you get d to the cn where c is a constant, but I, the constant might be like six or something. I'm not sure. For the for the precision. For the for the overall. Oh, I think you could do the n squared. Uh, I don't see an n squared. I think the big n is a d to the n and d to the n. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, this big n, this big n has to be about. Oh, right, we're right, because this n also depends on the precision. So this big n is like d to the n. So that's oh yeah. So there's a d to the n squared. Yeah. Um, you could try to hammer down the dependence on p to, but I haven't tried to do. Um, so I wanted to finish by mentioning an example that uh, David's uh, collaborator Edgar Costa back at NYU has computed. Um, is this NTL6? Yes. It is. Okay. So he's using NTL6. But for these purposes it's the same as... Yeah, it doesn't. Okay, it doesn't. Yeah. okay, so this is an example of a quartic K3 surface, um, which I guess he probably is interested in because he's Yuri's too. So he's doing K3 trusses. So, so he wanted to be able to compute this kind of K3 surface example. So this is a dense quartic K3. Um, it is non-degenerate uh, over Q. Um, okay, whatever. Doesn't matter what it is exactly. Uh, maybe this part matters more. So take P to be 49999. Um, and then in a reasonable amount of compute time, so this is about six CPU hours, uh, you find that the P2 of ZF looks like this. Now remember I told you it has these factors of P coming from the Hodge uh, polygon. So I'm just gonna give you the, the part with the P stripped out. So these are some numbers. And if you check in Sage, which I did, um, uh, if I can find it, Oh, it's over here. If you check in Sage, uh, you build the polynomial with those coefficients, and you take its roots. Uh, I mean, I can run it again so that you can see I'm not cheating. Uh, so the the uh, the the right each at roots to the absolute, absolute values of the minus two uh, has norm uh, p squared. I suppose I could take out the two 